So welcome to the introductory lecture to arts and literature. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about tipping points in the cultural domain, in language, symbol, and storylines. Uh, already from Professor Pakala's lectures, you're aware of tipping points in ecosystems. So you might have an invasive species that comes in and incrementally uh, a set of small events topples the system over into a new state. Now that can be true of culture as well as it can be true of biology. And so if we think of the Me, Me Too movement, we think of Black Lives Matter, we think of ACT UP during the uh, HIV crisis in the, in the early 90s, uh, we think of the Marriage Equality Act. There are these moments where the baseline, the norm, the cult set of cultural norms tip over uh, symbolically uh, and narratively into another state of being. So I'm going to be talking about that, uh, the, the, the presence and power of tipping points in the specific context of climate change today. So first, what can the arts do? Throughout human history, the most important political battles have been fought on the territory of the imagination and what stories we allow ourselves to tell depend on what we can imagine. Okay? So every, every great social movement, whether it's for civil rights, whether it's for um, um, universal suffrage, whether it's opposition to the, uh, for the, uh, the overthrow of apartheid, um, every social movement has had a strong cultural uh, element. Okay? And this includes the environmental movements that we'll be talking about today. So how can the arts help us identify emotionally with environmental changes that otherwise feel abstract? Those changes feel abstract because they occur across vast tracts of space and time, across planetary space and multi-generational, even multi-millennial time. Okay? So in the context of this course, how can we feel 2050? It seems sometimes impossibly remote. Um, but the scales that we're dealing with globally and in terms of time uh, make it quite demanding to inhabit the data with uh, an emotional energy, with a, with a, with a deep caring. Okay? So I want to uh, ground this in, in looking at this video. Um, and I will play it and then uh, we'll discuss the mood of the video in particular. <laughs> 
Okay, so this is your clicker question. The mood of this video is A, triumphalist, B, emotionally neutral, C, elegiac, D, comedic, E, satirical. The question is here? On the clicker, it's not on the clicker. Oh, okay. Um, the clicker's running here, yeah, but maybe it's not on the original video. Okay, well, sure. I'm getting some responses, 29 responses, but obviously not everybody's getting it. Uh, so let me just do it differently uh, with the results we have. Okay, C is dominant here. Okay. Yep. Oh, you got it. Okay, thanks, Robbie. Yeah. Right. Okay. So there's an overwhelming majority of people who read this video uh, as elegiac, okay? Um, and so what you're reading is a set of cultural codes uh, in terms of the music, in terms of the percussive use of the glaciers collapsing. Um, and it's hard to reduce those cultural codes to data. So this is what I'd call non-data driven knowledge. And we all depend on a consensus of codes in order to negotiate in our daily lives, okay? Um, and so we know that there's some cultures where shaking your head from side to side uh, means yes, and other cultures where uh, shaking your head side to side means no. So there can be cultural uh, confusion in those places. It's very possible um, that there's a culture out there where the majority of people would read this as comedic. Uh, I'm not certain of that, uh, but certainly uh, cultural codes can be very specific. Okay, so in terms of what I was saying about tipping points, this assumes a certain pathos, a certain understanding of what glaciers mean symbolically in the current moment. And that meaning mightn't have existed, say, 40 years ago. Um, so let me, let me go into a bit more detail on this. Okay, seeing glaciers are new. The two terms I want to introduce here, two opposing terms, defamiliarization and naturalization. So defamiliarization is when we use a surprising image to see something afresh. So from this Annie DeFranco uh, song, Love is a piano dropped from a four-story window, okay? Um, probably most of us haven't thought of love in that way, and it encourages us to literally see a piano falling from a window, okay? The opposite of that is naturalization, where an image has been used so often that it becomes cliched and routine and we don't see it. So if you say, I'm experiencing a roller coaster of emotions during COVID, um, when you say that to a friend, your friend's not likely to literally, in their imagination, be inhabiting a fairground, okay? Because roller coaster is, is a cliche, okay? Um, similarly, the term carbon footprint was coined in 1992. When it was coined, it was seen as a bright new image, a kind of poetry. Now it's just a dull technical term, and we don't literally see the footprint. Similarly, with something like greenhouse gases, we don't see the greenhouse anymore because it's become uh, such a quotidian, such a cliched phrase, okay? 
So what I'm interested in, in terms of these tipping points, these cultural tipping points, is what are called stirrings in the cemetery of dead metaphors. So what is a dead metaphor? Back in the 19th century, uh, Emerson put it this way, dead metaphors are fossil poetry. The deadest word once held a brilliant picture. So the roller coaster is an example of fossil poetry. It's poetry that has sunk down into the realm of, of cliche or everyday life. And we've lost the glitter of its original poetic usage. Um, the uh, sci-fi novelist Kim Stanley Robinson says, when it comes to the environment, the invisible hand of the market never picks up the check. Okay? So normally when we talk about the hand of the market, we don't see a physical hand. And so he's playing with that and he's reanimating the hand as if it belongs to a body uh, uh, sitting uh, at a restaurant and uh, the invisible hand of the market refuses to pick up the check. Okay. So metaphoric meltdown. So I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, dramatic changes in the physical climate can have a profound effect on the climate of connotations. What I mean is what words and symbols and stories mean in a shifting, destabilizing climate. Okay, so if we talk about a glacial pace of change, um, I remember when I was doing my PhD dissertation, my dis uh, supervisor saying, you're moving at a glacial pace, speed up, okay? But now that phrase is ambiguous because glaciers are moving too rapidly. They're accelerating. Um, and so one could be rightfully confused in encountering that phrase does glacial pace of change mean too fast or too slow? Okay. Um, and so over time, that meaning has become blurred. Similarly, the idea of carving glaciers uh, was coined by scientists as a procreative metaphor. Okay. Now, as we know that glaciers are fracturing and falling off, uh, it's less has less of a positive connotation than um, a, a negative connotation. It's a source of anxiety, not celebration. Okay. Permafrost, uh, what do we do with impermanent permafrost? Okay. When permafrost was coined, the assumption was it was there forever. Uh, with a destabilizing climate, that is shifted. Uh, similarly, to the tip of the iceberg, skating on thin ice, um, a, a, a cliche, a common phrase, uh, you know, as you prepare for exams, you're skating on thin ice. Well, climatically, we're also skating on thin ice. So these, these, these dead metaphors take on a, a different resonance. Blanketed with snow, another, um, you know, cliche. Uh, but we know from the Rockies to the Alps, um, ski operations are now, in many cases, putting synthetic blankets over the snow uh, in order to protect it from the changing climate, okay? Uh, snowflake generation, a rising tide lifts all boats, okay? The idea that, say, in an economy, uh, if, if, uh, that, that you would get a general um, <coughs> rise. Uh, but rising tides now, you know, particularly if you're from Florida or Louisiana or that, rising tides have a different kind of anxiety-producing um, effect. Uh, from when they were originally termed, okay? So, English developed in the Northern Hemisphere in a temperate world, and so, as we've just seen, it is suffused with references to ice and snow. If English had developed in Indonesia, or in Congo, or in Brazil, it's likely there would be fewer references uh, to snow and ice in everyday speech. So I grew up in Southern Africa and in a number of African languages, which was, was my major, uh, there's this phrase, the ears of the hippo, which is the equivalent of the tip of the iceberg. Because it was a subtropical environment, nobody knew anything about ice and snow, but they knew about hippos. So hippos are the, um, the mammals that cause the most deaths in sub-Saharan Africa. What they do is they descend beneath the surface and erupt beneath your, your, your canoe, your kayak. So when I was kayaking uh, as a kid, we were less worried about crocodiles than about hippos, especially when the ears disappeared because you knew they would 
come up from below. Okay, so that you can see how a, a different um, climate and a different ecosystem had an impact on the norms of the language. Okay, um, so so let me just say that from around 1300 to 1870, Europe experienced what was called the Little Ice Age, which some of you may have heard of, which were uh, winters with below average temperatures. Uh, and in that context, you had uh, uh, glacial advances in many uh, instances. Uh, this is a, a from a poem called Mont Blanc by uh, the romantic poet Shelley from 1817. And I just want to read this and think about how the glacier appears in the poem. The glaciers creep like snakes that watch their prey from their far fountains slow rolling on. There many a precipice, frost and the sun in scorn of mortal power have piled dome, pyramid and pinnacle a city of death distinct with many a tower and wall impregnable of beaming ice. So this is a poem written in the context of the Little Ice Age where glaciers were much more frequently advancing than retreating. And so the glacier here becomes, is anthropomorphized and it becomes a threat that is encroaching on human habitation rather than, as we're now more likely to see it, as a kind of endangered species, uh, as precarious, as vulnerable uh, to human, the impact of human actions, okay? So you can see how there's this, this constant interplay um, between the cultural connotations and the, and the climate. In the same vein, uh, the famous uh, Central European novelist Franz Kafka said, a book must be the ice axe that breaks open the frozen sea within us. Okay? So here, frozenness has a negative connotation. The ice axe is liberating. Okay? Um, so rather than being concerned about a world in which there's too little freezing, uh, the assumption, the baseline assumption here is uh, that frozenness is a bad thing, okay? So here we're at the 2015 uh, Paris Climate Conference and sections of um, um, the ice, uh, icebergs were taken to Paris, which is obviously a milder climate than the Arctic, and were these, these sculptures melted over the duration of the conference, okay? So in the, in the top left uh, image, you have a little girl uh, sheltering, the, uh, trying to slow down the melt of the statue. Uh, and so there's a sense of intergenerational care that that uh, sculpture uh, conveys. Uh, and on the bottom right, uh, again, the sense of, of mourning, a tenderness, a uh, sense of the precariousness of ice. Um, and so here a sculptor and a climate scientist uh, collaborated also in Paris 2015 uh, to create this um, uh, sculpture which was called Ice Watch. And so there's a pun clearly on Ice Watch. It's a clock, clock ticking uh, as the ice melts. Um, and it's also about witnessing, uh, about being on the Ice Watch, uh, watching the ice. Um, being vigilant. Okay, so I wanted to, I've talked a little bit about language and grounded it in, in, in the world of, of shifting glaciers. And now I want to talk about it in a second context, which is the impact of climate change on the symbolic evolution of the polar bear. So back in 1922, um, Coca-Cola um, adopted the polar bear as its primary advertising mascot, okay? Why, and, and so this, this polar bear is sugared up and, and tubby and pretty happy, it's chill. Uh, what was happening in 1922? Well, for a lot of Americans, they were gaining access to refrigeration in the home for the first time, okay? So refrigeration was a status symbol. Uh, 
it was a novelty and the polar bear uh, became a very powerful advertising tool, doubtless unpaid, but uh, in, um, dragooned into the Coca-Cola advertising uh, campaign. Okay. Now the polar bear has changed symbolically. Uh, it has become a shorthand for uh, biodiversity loss, for climate anxieties. Um, and so here we have what has become in the contemporary era more of the dominant idea of what a polar bear symbolizes. Okay, uh, So this is a sort of polar bear 2.0. And the polar bear becomes in many images, in many environmental uh, funding drives, the polar bear becomes a kind of um, non-human climate refugee, okay, stranded, um, a, a, a creature of pathos. And again, at the Paris conference, we had this uh, ingenious statue, which uh, does double work. Over time, it melts. And so it speaks to the, the, the loss of um, ice in the Arctic. But as it melts, a skeleton emerges, uh, a, a museum-like skeleton. So it also speaks to the idea of species loss or biodiversity loss. So it, it does double duty here. Um, and so Coca-Cola had a dilemma. Okay, this new polar bear, uh, the scrawny, um, um, struggling, anxious polar bear on the verge of starvation, doesn't quite fit its campaign. Okay, so that polar bear was decommissioned by um, Coca Cola uh, because they realized that there was this symbolic gray zone where the chubby, happy, um, e um, eternally chill polar bear that they'd started out with didn't really fit the contemporary environmental moment. Uh, so let me just look at a, another commercial uh, that tries to oops, hang on, adapt to... An electric Nissan Leaf. Innovation for the planet. Innovation for all. Oops. Okay. Um, so what you can see here is an attempt on the part of the advertisers to update the polar bear um, and not only to have, so you move beyond the, the um, well-sugared Coca-Cola polar bear, we also um, not using the emaciated polar bear, but we are looking at uh, the relationship between emissions and the uh, flourishing of the polar bear. Okay, uh, it also um, speaks to the increasing interaction between human communities uh, and polar bears, like in Churchill, uh, Canada. Uh, so it's 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 making the the uh, polar bear more contemporary. Okay, so I wanted to move now to uh, some, a couple of storylines. So we've talked about language uh, being impacted by changing climate. We've talked of, about symbols like the glacier or the polar bear being impacted by um, climate change. And now I wanted to talk a little bit about storylines. Okay. So the Nexus course as a whole is really a, 
an act of speculative nonfiction. So what do I mean by that? We're taking the year 2050 and we're trying to chart plausible routes that will get us to a particular constellation of, uh, of, of systems, okay? And um, so a lot of corporations do this as well. If you think of um, Exxon or Mobil or, um, I mean, uh, Exxon Mobil or um, uh, Shell or BP, they have um, in-house narratologists, in other words, often experts in film or storytelling, that will create videos of plausible futures as the corporation sees them, sometimes very much slanted in, in terms of, of greenwashing. Um, so this is different from fiction. If we think of uh, a best-selling novel like Kim Stanley Robinson's 2140, New York 2140, that is an act of imagination, okay? It's untethered from data. It's just saying, okay, let's um, situate ourselves in an imaginary New York um, in 2140, uh, a much wetter New York, and let's see how the city is coping, okay? So what I'm talking about is something different, not uh, speculative fiction, but speculative non-fiction. You could also call this anticipatory documentary, okay? The idea of trying to document events that have not yet happened, which is so central to what we're doing in this course. So this is a book called The Water Will Come, Rising Seas, Sinking Cities, and the Remaking of the Civilized World by the journalist Jeff Goodell. This is how, the very first uh, paragraph of the book. After the hurricane hit Miami in 2037, a foot of sand covered the famous bow tie floor in the lobby of the Fontainebleau Hotel in Miami Beach. A dead manatee floated in the pool where Elvis had once swum. Most of the damage came not from the hurricane's 175 mile an hour winds, but from the 20 foot storm surge that overwhelmed the low lying city. In South Beach, historic Art Deco buildings were swept off their foundations. Mansions on Star Island were flooded up to their cut glass doorknobs. Okay, so what he's doing here, it's not a purely uh, imaginative act of fantasy. He's presenting this as documentation of a plausible future based on available data. And then he's grounding it in a specific environment um, and encouraging us to act in order to prevent what he's documenting from happening in a way. Okay, that's the impulse behind the book. So there are many, many books like this and some of them stretch much further out in time. So uh, one of the best-selling books in this genre is by Alan Wiseman called The World Without Us. And he imagines a post-human world and looks at what happens to the uh, infrastructure and the, um, the garbage and so forth that humans have left behind. So he's interested in the process of transformation and decay. Um, Similarly, uh, Jan, uh, Jan Jelosevich, The uh, Earth After Us, What Legacy Will Humans Leave in the Rocks? Again, a very far out future, an attempt to document empirically um, a post-human world. Okay? And this is very central to the whole idea of the Anthropocene, which I'll be talking about next week. Uh, the idea that humans are leaving residues that will be cultural clues that some future geologist or archeologist can read uh, as a kind of uh, a text that we've left behind, okay? So, so as we've discussed in this course, obviously the further out you go in time, the more nonfiction swings over towards fiction. It's far, it's difficult, but it's easier to paint a plausible 2050 than it is to paint a plausible uh, 2100, okay? And once you get to 10,000 years, you're pretty much in fantasy world anyway. And I don't know that 10,000 years from now, nonfiction can really exist, okay? It's, it's hard. It, 
because the variables just become so immense. Um, this is from uh, Pete Buttigieg uh, from a speech he gave a couple of years ago. I often contemplate the year 2054, the year in which I hope to retire at the age our current president is now. We need to reflect the fact that we live in a world that is closer to 2054 than it is to 1945. So as far as I know, he never took the Nexus course. Um, but basically, it, a similar principle is at work here. What he's trying to do is to shift the cultural obsession with the so-called greatest generation with World War II and, that, and saying, for my generation, 2054 is a much more pertinent point of reference than 1945, okay? And clearly, he, there's also a kind of a coded message here that this was during Trump's time, of course, that there's an old president and there's a young presidential candidate, okay? So he was trying to make a, a generational difference. Um, okay, so the second storyline I wanted to talk about is uh, what I call slow violence and, and to think through the idea of climate change as a form of slow violence. But what do we mean by slow violence? Okay, here's a couple of definitions. Slow violence is a violence of delayed destruction that is typically dispersed across time and space. An attritional violence that is often not viewed as violence at all. Slow violence is neither spectacular nor instantaneous but rather incremental and accretive, its calamitous repercussions playing out across a range of timescales. So what do we mean by this? So if we take the example of 9-11, uh, 20th anniversary coming up, that was a very cinematic catastrophe. And among the many forms of trauma and disorientation that people experienced, was the sense that they were inside a movie. They'd already seen this type of image in so many apocalyptic movies, okay? Um, if we take the, a contrasting example of something like the deaths inflicted by Agent Orange as a result of the Vietnam War or what uh, Vietnamese call the American War, okay? So you will see, um, Statements like, during the 12 years of the Vietnam War, 55,000 Americans lost their lives and a million uh, Vietnamese uh, lost their lives, okay? So you've got a, a book ending of the time, but we know that through biomagnification, Agent Orange continued to uh, foreshorten people's lives uh, long after the official end of the war, okay? Um, so what you can see is how um, sometimes accidentally people forget the long-term deaths, the slow incremental deaths, and sometimes strategically uh, politicians and others can abuse uh, the idea of violence to, in order to exclude, to minimize the deaths, okay? Uh, from a certain point of view, from the general's point of view, when the Vietnam War ended, it ended. Okay, from those inhabiting the, those uh, landscapes and ecologies, it hadn't ended, and the death continued incrementally. To give a non-environmental example, uh, around, say, domestic assault, uh, there are certain um, conventional images of what domestic assault looks like. Somebody will have bruises or cuts. Um, but what if somebody is locked inside a room, uh, the door is locked and is traumatized that way and held captive? Uh, what if that is done repeatedly? What physical evidence is there? Okay. It can be even more traumatic, but it happens over time um, and it's, le it's harder often for the courts to recognize that as violence. Okay? So, so this question of the time frame of violence becomes very important, not least in terms of climate change uh, and in terms of extinction, because you have an incremental set of processes that uh, are set in motion 
and then you have a tipping point, okay? Um, so this is another way of, of saying this. In an age when the media venerate the spectacular, revere the spectacular, when public policy is shaped primarily around perceived immediate need, we need to ask, how can we convert into image and narrative disasters that are slow moving and long in the making? Disasters that are anonymous and star nobody, disasters that are attritional and of indifferent interest to the sensation driven technologies of our image world. Um, so, in terms of politicians, many of whom are elected for four year cycles, um, the long-term environmental good is outside the parameters of their period of office, okay? So in terms of both positive and negative uh, actions, uh, their dominant frame is four years. In the media cycle, it's even quicker. And so one of the things that we're grappling with uh, in this course and in, uh, in our age at large, one of the things that we're grappling with is the radical mismatch between the kind of nanosecond fracturing of our digital attention span and the demand that we think in decades, centuries, even millennia in the case of the Anthropocene. And so we're trying, our brain is trying to do two things, okay? And so the idea of, you know, geologists uh, sometimes talk about abrupt climate change. Well, from, from their perspective, it's abrupt. From our perspective, from ordinary uh, citizens, non-geologists, it's pretty slow, okay? Uh, and so trying to reconcile these different temporal speeds is, is a key dimension to what we're trying to do in this course, to infuse urgency where our brain is saying, ah, that's decades from now, you know. So if we think about what was perceived to be the dominant threat in the second half of the 20th century. It was the nuclear holocaust, uh, specifically, particularly in the Cold War. Okay? And that fear, exploited by many, many films, was centered on an image like this. This is a bikini atoll um, uh, explosion. And it was called a mushroom cloud. So that's a case, another case of a dead metaphor. Okay, we've all heard about mushroom clouds. You don't necessarily think of um, a mushroom at the base of a tree or something, but you can see where the, where the idea came from and it became a dead metaphor. So this was much more compatible as a threat with an idea, a conventional idea of spectacular violence. This is a very cinematic image. Um, in contrast to the kind of violence that we're dealing with when we grapple with um, climate destabilization. Okay. So let me go to another example. This is the uh, um, Deepwater Horizon uh, uh, explosion in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Okay. And it started with a very cinematic image, uh, almost a familiar image of the exploding rig. Okay. We, we have the flames, we have the smoke, we have the physical collapse, okay? Um, and then after that, uh, what we had was a, was a kind of um, a webcam on, focused on the, the oil gushing uh, from, from the hole down below, okay? Which just went on, on and on for months. And as many of you may know, um, Corexit was sprayed by plane over the Gulf. And these, these uh, sort of maroon spots on the top left, those are where the Corexit has bound together with the oil. And Corexit is a very toxic substance that's banned in Europe. Uh, and people have argued that uh, the strategy of spraying Corexit was less about controlling the oil than making it invisible, that it would, it would um, the, it, the, the, the oil corrects it combination would become submerged beneath the surface and so the damage would be less visible um, but corrects it uh, does have a toxic legacy okay so this is more an image of incremental attritional flow violence 
that lacks sensation. It's not as sensational as the rig, but long term in terms of ecosystem health and human health, um, it is more perilous. Okay, so we're also talking about biodiversity loss and, and extinction. And uh, I think we, could, we can approach extinction also as a kind of slow violence. Uh, the philosopher Tom Van Duren talks about the dull edge of extinction. Okay? Uh, extinction isn't uh, a 9-11 type event. Uh, something exists uh, and, and, and declines and declines and declines then there's no breeding population, then it doesn't exist, okay? It's a pretty quiet process. Um, and the journalist Mira Subramanian is, uh, calls extinction whispering death, okay? It, it doesn't have a loud percussive cultural resonance, okay? Um, so I wanted to close with this image um, from Greta Thunberg. Uh, that draws together th some of the threads of the course. In the background, you have sort of apocalyptic skies, um, and you have the polar bear uh, submerged down below, bottom left. You have Greta Thunberg rising. It's an ambiguous image. She could be rising or she could be sinking. Okay, is is the water uh, about to engulf her? Or is she emerging from the deep as a kind of a superpower and so forth? Uh, and you can see here how um, the, the, the wordplay on the seas are rising and so are we. Okay? The, both the physical landscape and the political landscape are drawn together in one image. Okay. Uh, so we have about five minutes left. If you have any questions or comments or thoughts, uh, I'm happy to field them. Uh, it's a small enough room we can, we can, we can talk. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll leave it there and um, uh, see you next Wednesday. Take care.